our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I bid you a hearty welcome to this time of worship. This is Columbia United Methodist Church, and I am Pastor Mar Bruner, and we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. I just want to make sure that you know that you are always welcome to join us online or in person if you should choose to. On this day, may your hearts feel strangely warmed as you experience the love and grace of God in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in your own lives. God is here, God is with us, and God is working in incredible and extraordinary and powerful ways in us and through us and around us all the time. So may we listen to that call to participate in all that God is doing in the world and witness to what we see God doing around us, in us, and through us. May we have the courage to follow God everywhere we go. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and today we are going to take a moment to remember all those who made the ultimate sacrifice and service to their country. My prayer is that we shall honor their memory, working to make sure that the values of freedom and wholeness that that they worked so hard to defend are indeed available to all persons, that what these brave men and women gave their lives for is a daily reality for everyone who calls this place home. And above all, may we work together for peace so that war will never be necessary again. May God hold the hearts of all who grieve on this day for loved ones lost in service to our nation. And now, friends, I invite you to quiet your hearts and your minds as we prepare for this time of worship with silent prayer. special Memorial Day prayer. Let us give thanks to God for the land of our birth, with all its chartered liberties, for all the wonder of our country's story. We give you thanks, O God. For leaders in nation and state, and for those who in days past and in these present times have labored for the commonwealth, we give you thanks, O God. For those who in all times and places have been true and brave and in the world's common ways have lived upright lives and ministered to their fellows, we give you thanks, O God. For those who served their country in its hour of need and especially for those who gave even their lives in that service, we give you thanks, O God. O Almighty God and most merciful Father, as we remember these your servants, remembering with gratitude their courage and strength, we hold before you those who mourn them. Look upon your bereaved servants with your mercy. As this day brings them memories of those they have lost a while, may it also bring your consolation and assurance that their loved ones are alive now and forever in your living presence. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And now, friends, join me to sing hymn number 519, Lift Every Voice and Sing.
disciples, I am so glad you are here today. And today, I want to ask you, do you love art? Oh my goodness, I like art a whole lot. And I love looking at those famous masterpieces that the painters of old had made. For example, this one is a really, really old one. This is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, such a beautiful painting. And do you know that she was considered to be the most beautiful woman of her time? This one is another one of my favorites. This one is by an artist named Vincent van Gogh, and this is called Starry Night. Do you see the stars in the sky and the moon? Oh, isn't that pretty? And then a lot of people don't like this artist, but I think his work is fascinating. Look at this. This is a painting by Jackson Pollock, and it may just look like random splashes and splotches, but these paintings are famous. They are hanging up in museums all over the world. I was thinking about masterpieces because in our Bible scripture, in Psalm 139, we read this. I praise you, O God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Friends, guess what? That means that each of you are God's masterpiece. God carefully put a lot of thought and care into who God created you to be. God knew who you would be before you were even born, before you were even starting to form. And now that you are here, you continue to be God's masterpiece. You continue to shine with the light that God has put inside you. And you are the only you that will ever be in this world. Isn't that incredible? Now, we're really good at standing in the mirror and criticizing ourselves, aren't we? We always wish we were shorter or taller, that our hair was a little more blonde or a little darker, that our nose was bigger or smaller, that our teeth were straighter or whatever it might be. But we always find faults with ourselves. But what if we remembered all of the time that we are God's masterpiece and that we are perfect just the way we are? When we look at ourselves that way, we can't help but see that other people around us are God's masterpiece too. They are just as unique and special and wonderful just the way they are as we are. God is so good. I am in awe of the fact that God loves us so much and that God took such care to create each and every one of us so that there is just one of us in this entire world. Isn't that cool? Let us pray. God, thank you for making us and for making us as special as you made us. Help us to love ourselves so that we can also love the other people that we share this life with, your other masterpieces. Help us to look at every person we see and remember that they are your masterpiece too. Help us to love and to live as people of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a beautiful week, little disciples. As we come before God on this morning, I ask that you keep the following persons in your daily prayers. D and Cecil K, Connie H, Linda R, Raleigh S, Nikki B, Stephanie, Joanne M, Penelope, Glenna S, Gloria W, Eddie M, John K, Doug M, Rick G, Bill R, Donna S, Robert C, Sally B, Mary B, Lori F, William L, Vadi, Edward P, Karen L, Craig K, Tina, Chuck S, Barbara, Terry and Debbie, Mary M, Mike and Bunny A, Joe B, Bob and Denise S, Rick M, Joyce B, Marge D, and Brenda B. May God surround each and every one of the persons that we lifted up today with God's presence, with God's healing touch, with comfort, with care, and everything and anything that might be needed that we don't even know how to ask, but that God will provide in abundance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray. 
Loving God, we come before you this morning thankful for the opportunity to gather in your name to pray and to praise and to worship you. We come before you as clay jars in which you have placed an incredible treasure. But we recognize, O oh Lord, that we are not perfect, that we make mistakes, that we fall short of your grace and glory every day. Forgive us, we pray. Make us to stand strong in your light so we can shine with your light. Make us into the people whom you have created and called us to be. May we work together for a just world in which all of your children may flourish and thrive. Give us the courage to resist evil and injustice in all the various forms we may encounter these in our lives. And give us the wisdom to seek your will and way for the world. Help us to work together for peace, so that no child may ever know the terror of war. On this difficult weekend, when we remember those who have died in service to this country, we also pray for those who are currently serving, for their families at home, and for the places in which they serve. May we never take for granted the ability to worship and live in freedom, for this is not the reality in every place, and freedom comes at a terrible cost to some. Be with us, O Lord. Help us to live lives that bear witness to who and whose we are in every realm of life. Be with those who are anxious and afraid, those who are tired, those who feel hopeless, those who feel forgotten, those who feel invisible, those who struggle for their daily needs. Make us your hands and feet to bring compassion and presence and physical help and lead us to the places and people where you need us most. Be with those who are ill, those who care for them, those who worry for them. May your healing presence provide whatever is needed in this and every moment. Be also, Lord God, with those who are dying and those who are grieving on this day. Fill them with your comfort and your peace. Lord, we are yours and you are ours. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for always being with us. Thank you for your Son, and thank you for the continued presence of your Holy Spirit working in us and through us for your glory. And now, God of mercy, with the confidence of your children, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This week we are starting a new sermon series that will keep us in the second letter to the Corinthians for the next four weeks. Today's passage is from 2 Corinthians 4 verses 5 through 12. This is the New Revised Standard Version. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The story of God for the covenant people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Shine in the darkness, O God, and shine in our hearts, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may grow in the knowledge of your glory, proclaiming Jesus Christ and not ourselves, until his life is made visible in us, even in us. May your word come through me, or in spite of me. Amen. 
Friends, have you ever thought about why you buy the things that you buy? I mean, if you're in the grocery store and there's three different products and um, you have a choice of which one to buy, isn't it true that we tend to be attracted to the prettier package? Unless we know, of course, what's inside, but especially if we're buying new products, we, we, they've done multiple studies on this and it has shown that people have um, a likelihood to buy things that are in a prettier box. Um, we, we somehow believe that what is inside the prettier box will somehow be superior or better than the slightly less attractive box next to it. We're even willing to pay more for that pretty box. Now the world around us is full of these shiny, pretty packages. For example, we look at the lives of others, of people around us. We see their nice homes, their nice cars, their nice clothes, their great jobs, and we think, oh, if we can just change our own package to look more like that, then we might be as happy as they are. So we spend our lives trying to get a little further ahead than we were. We tend to pity those who have less than us and we envy those who have more. And it seems like no matter how much stuff we surround ourselves with, we never seem to really find that missing something we strive after. We can take it even further than this. We look at ourselves in the mirror and quickly, we can make a laundry list of things we would like to change about ourselves. I mean, if I could just lose a few pounds, or get in better shape, or if my nose could be a little smaller, or my teeth a little straighter or whiter, my neck a little tighter, then I might be happy with who I am. If I could just be perfect, then everything would be so much better. Now in Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16, the psalmist writes, For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. Friends, we were fearfully and wonderfully made, thoughtfully, carefully, lovingly formed and shaped to be exactly who God intended us to be. When you look in the mirror each morning, remind yourself that you, you, are God's incredible and priceless masterpiece. In this entire world, there is no other person exactly like you. You can have your father's nose, you can have your mother's eyes, but you are the only you that will ever exist in this world. Our packaging, you know, may not exactly be perfect according to the world's or even our own standards, but God sees our hearts. There is something within you that makes you unique and special and one of a kind. Oh, if only we could see ourselves as God sees us. The church in Corinth was a difficult community for Paul. The city of Corinth was made up of people from a very, very vastly diverse variety of cultures, ethnic groups, a plethora of different lifestyles and religious beliefs. It was a port city, and, and with trade and, and commerce being a major focus, there was a lot of different people coming in and out of the city all of the time. In many ways, Corinth was kind of a shiny beacon, like a sort of a model city in the Roman Empire, but... It also had a significant um, issue with moral corruption and ethical issues throughout the city. You can imagine then with so many different people, with so many different commitments and backgrounds and baggage and everything else, trying to come together to form a church and set some community standards and some, some common practices and be one would be extraordinarily difficult. Additionally, Paul had a lot of competition in Corinth. Several other apostles, actually, competed for the loyalty of the people, and, and Paul had some significant issues with the message they were preaching because they were not always very much aligned 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How then can Paul compete with these smooth-talking, charismatic, super-apostles, as Paul himself calls them, um, that seem to have all the right answers, that come in a shiny, attractive package, when he himself has frequently had to admit to his weaknesses, to his failures, and even contend with his very unimpressive self. He can't always find the words. He's not much to look at, he always tells us. Surely, if God truly had intended and called him to this vocation as the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul imagined, sometimes I wonder, why did he not enjoy more success and advantage and ease and fewer setbacks? Why could he not be an impressive specimen with a golden tongue? That would make everything so very much easier. And yet, Paul continued to follow his call. And he continued to love the church in Corinth and continued to invest his time and his energy in ensuring that they bore a true witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ they had received and not some other version of it. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 3, Paul writes to the church, Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation either to you or from you, do we? Because you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. I mean, they're like a, you know, the, his letter of recommendation. And you show that you are a letter of Christ, Paul writes, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. God had put the gospel inside of the Corinthian church. And even if they were dealing right now with division and disunity and pride and all sorts of other issues, they are still shining with the gospel message, shining to the world, to Jesus Christ. In the end, it is all about Jesus. Jesus is the one in whom they are one, in whom they can lay that foundation for community that can help them be together and work together and prioritize together and follow God together because Jesus is the cornerstone, the one in whom they find their purpose and their commitment, in whom they learn to love and serve one another in humility and patience with mutual regard and compassion for one another. They have something within them something powerful, something beautiful, an incredible treasure placed there by God. The God who created light in the world, the God who continued to call the people out of their darkness and into the light has now shone in their hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is verse six. Jesus is the light of the world. He came into this world as a human being, not to condemn it, not to destroy it, but to redeem it, to reconcile it to God, to, to set us in right relationship with God, to show us how. Jesus came to show us who God is and what God is all about. And God is all about love and compassion and humble service and care and concern for one another with abundance and with thriving and above all with life. Jesus is God with us, the God we can know. And in the gospel, in the gospel that God has given us, God has taken this incredible treasure that is the gospel and placed it in clay jars, which is us, the human beings. Now, a clay jar in ancient times um, would be much like, in today's terms, the disposable plastic containers that are a dime a dozen that we can buy just about anywhere. I'm not talking about Tupperware. That's nice stuff, right? I'm talking about the really cheap take and toss, kind of like if it gets stained, if it gets broken, you just kind of recycle it and you get a new one, that, that kind of thing. Um, clay jars were much the same. They were not very impressive. They were utilitarian things. They were unadorned. They were kind of common. They were pretty fragile. They were pretty ordinary, and people used them for all kinds of things. You would store water in there, or wine, or you could put oil, or grains, or whatever you needed a clay jar for, you could use it for storage. However, if they got broken, they got cracked, they got damaged, they were thrown out because we could just make a new one. There's no point in repairing something so cheap and so, so common and ordinary. Who 
would put a priceless treasure in such a vessel. What, what was God thinking? This doesn't seem like an appropriate place to put a treasure. And yet, this is exactly what God has done. As the light and the power, the extraordinary power of God works in us and through us, we are reminded every day that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. This is verse 7. In these fragile, unimpressive, ordinary bodies of ours lies the greatest treasure the world has ever seen. How marvelous that God has chosen us to carry it. In our mortal lives, in our lives that we live here and now on this earth, the person of Jesus is made human once more. So often, we are the Jesus that people see. When, when we are telling people about Jesus or when people know that we are Christians, the way we live our lives is a representation of the God that we serve, of Jesus Christ. How are we representing our Lord? What do people think of this Jesus we follow when they see how we live and move and breathe in the world around us? Life is hard. Paul makes a laundry list with items that we can certainly all relate to. We have all indeed experienced our share of affliction. We are confused at times and we don't know what to do next. We feel persecuted and harassed by the difficulties of life and Sometimes we feel downright struck down by the world that we live in. Yes, Paul, <laughs> we know. But yet, we can also go to the other side of what Paul says. Because of this treasure within us, the gospel, the light of God, we know that we can persevere in hope. We can keep going because God is in us and with us. We are never crushed. We are not driven to despair. We are not forsaken and we are not destroyed. Our clay jars may be full of chips and cracks by now, but God still chooses each of us anyway. We endure and keep going, not because of anything we can do on our own, but because we are God's own. God is working in us and through us, encouraging us to take yet another step, to reach out one more hand, to speak words of life, to shine with the light of Christ in spite of all the things that we face. Henry Stanley Haskins once wrote, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. All of us have a past. We don't always know what our futures hold either. But the light and the power of God within us fills us with hope and perseverance. God overcomes the mistakes of our past, and God will overcome any mistakes that we will make in the future too. With God in us, what lies behind us and even what lies ahead of us are tiny matters, as Mr. Huskins says, because God is within us, shining through us, and in our very lives then, God is glorified. Our packaging may not be entirely perfect. In fact, if we're really honest with ourselves, we are each full of flaws and imperfections. But God has chosen us. We, who were fearfully and wonderfully made, mm, we have been chosen by God to carry this incredible treasure of the good news of Jesus Christ within us his life, his death, and his resurrection. And not just carry it, but share it. Give it away to as many people as we encounter in a given moment. It is our very weakness, our imperfection, that proclaims our sacred worth and what reveals the extraordinary power of God within us. The God who promised to be with us to help us as we undertake this incredible task of discipleship in the world. All the things that we face in this life help us to discover and then grow to trust that by the grace of God, the light is always brighter than any darkness. Life is always stronger than death. And within these bodies of ours lies a treasure of immeasurable value one that God has trusted us with.
Now, friends, when you get home, or if you're already home, when you're finished here, go and stand in front of the mirror. Take a long and good look at yourself. Now, I want you to look beyond the things that we immediately begin to criticize about ourselves the minute we get in front of a mirror, like, we gotta, like you know, look at all the things. Don't do that today. Instead, remind yourself that you, you are God's incredible masterpiece, fearfully and wonderfully made, chosen by God to carry this beautiful and priceless treasure of the life of Jesus Christ within you. There is something powerful and beautiful that lies within you. Live this life you have been given every day so that everyone you encounter will see Jesus in you and give glory to God. There is only one you in this entire world, so make your mark for the sake of Jesus Christ. Leave this world a little bit better than you found it and a little bit closer to God's vision and intention for it. You have it in you because God is in you. Amen. Remember the treasure within these clay jars, our mortal bodies, the extraordinary power, something far beyond our own, in which the life of Jesus is being made visible in you. Grant, O oh Lord, that what we have said with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts, we may indeed practice in our lives. In the name of your Son, the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Grace and peace to you, my friends. God be with you until we meet again. Mm -hmm.